Good morning. Everybody doing okay? You guys good? That was, that was kind of rough, guys. Let's just be honest. Yeah. That's okay. Good to see you. I was telling the 8 o'clock, um, I'm, usually, I'm, I'm usually relatively alert for this service. At the 8, um, I have a hard time going to sleep at night, and, and then, um, you know, I, I have to be here pretty early in the morning. I usually get here about 6.30, but, uh, and, and I'm tired at the 8. And, and the reason I was so tired this morning is I have a 7-pound multi-poo, because uh, I'm a man. And, um, and I, made the, I made the mistake. She's my dog, man. I love this dog so much. Her name's Charlotte. She's beautiful. And uh, I made the mistake seven years ago when we got her. I, I didn't have the heart to make her sleep in a crate. We bought a hot pink crate. It's a true story. Uh, and uh, I didn't have the heart to make her sleep in it. So she has slept in my bed by my side for the last seven years. And... Um, most of the time, that's great until she's like all up in my rib cage, and, and it's shocking how such a little dog can take up so much space. I'm rambling. Anyone else just like love their little dog? Is anyone? Yeah. You just reach a stage in your life where you're like, I need a little dog, and uh, that's where I'm at because I'm getting old. So, okay, we have been working through um, a book of the Bible. This is my first time teaching it, Second Corinthians. If you're new here, this is what we do. We take Books of the Bible, and we work through them word for word, chapter by chapter, line by line, until we get through it. This one uh, is very, very interesting. It's, it's interesting for a couple of reasons, but it's written by a man named Paul. It was a letter to a church in southern Greece. Uh, there's two letters in the Bible to this church in southern Greece in an area called Corinth. And in a nutshell, this was a group of people who knew the truth. They knew about Jesus. They had been taught well by Paul. Uh, but they just seemed to not be able to get their act together. Uh, kept falling back into sinful lifestyles, making a lot of the same mistakes, kind of turning away from their faith and what they know to be right and, and doing what they know to be wrong. And so Paul sent two letters to them that we know about and um, rebuking them and, and not doing this because he's trying to be mean. He's doing it because he genuinely loves these people. But the relationship between the church in Corinth, the people in Corinth, and Paul, their relationship had been, had been fractured. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't so hot at the time that he wrote this letter. And so in chapter two, last week, we talked a, a, quite a bit about relationships with each other, uh, about forgiveness, about restoration, about how sometimes we have to have boundaries in those relationships. And if we're going to have healthy earthly relationships, we have to have a very healthy heavenly relationship. With our Heavenly Father, God, that's, that's, that's where, as we're going to talk about today, that's where our ability comes from to have healthy relationships in this life. So that's what we talked about in chapter 2. We're going to do chapter 3 today, and we'll get through it very, very quickly. It's, it's uh, not long at all. And we're going to talk a lot about uh, the Ten Commandments, the law. We're going to talk a lot about, uh, Paul mentions, not laws written on paper, but laws written on the human heart. And so what that's going to bring up today is desire. What is our desire? Are we here today just to kind of check off some boxes and, and, and avoid punishment? Or are we here because we have a genuine desire to know more about our creator and to build a relationship with our creator? So we're going to talk about this desire to want to see things differently. Okay? So you should have got a notes handout. Everything will be in there. Uh, everything, just everything you've ever wanted to know is in that handout. Everything will be on the screen behind me. If you have a Bible, uh, we're in the New Testament. You have Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. That's where we're hanging out today in chapter 3. And if you have the Experience Community app, just click on Sermon Notes. And um, everything is right there. Everyone's good. Is the sun shining out there today? Nice. Look forward to it. All right. Let me pray. And uh, we'll jump into chapter three and, and we'll talk about some fun stuff, okay? Let's pray. Father God, we love you. Lord, we thank you so much. I thank you so much for everyone in the room this morning, God. I thank you for uh, the beautiful weather outside today. Thank you, God, for a safe space where we can come and we can worship and we can learn and, and study, God. So I pray, Lord, that you just bless us today. Keep your hand on us. Uh, not just our church, Lord. We pray for every single church in Murfreesboro that you would keep your hand on them, protect them. We pray, God, for our other campuses and the churches in those areas, and we just pray, Lord, that as we study your word today, that you would, um, that you would, as your word says, take the veil off our eyes, God. Lord, allow us to see more clearly. Give us a strong desire to want to have a better relationship with you and the people around us, and 
We love you and we thank you and we praise you and we pray all these things in your name, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm gonna read a little bit. We'll go back and we'll, uh, we'll discuss it, okay? Paul writes this. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are Christ's letter delivered by us, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence we have through Christ before God. It's not that we are competent in ourselves, to claim anything is coming from ourselves, I like this part, but our adequacy is from God. He has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. We'll talk about that phrase here in a second. First thing is this, Paul asks uh, the group in, in Corinth, the Corinthians, a couple of questions and he expects them to say, No. The first question is, he goes, have I been guilty of being arrogant? Have I uh, commended myself is what he says. And, And his thing is no, no, he hasn't done that. Secondly, he says, do I need a letter of recommendation so you guys will trust me to vouch for my character? Now that sounds like a weird thing in our culture, but that was not a weird thing in the first century. What would happen is, if uh, someone like Peter or Paul or Apollos or James or any of these guys were to travel around and share the gospel, they would actually get a sealed letter that vouched for their character from either um, important teachers in the Christian community or a church in the Christian community. And and so back then, you know, you couldn't like Google search someone or, or Facebook stalk them to make sure they're not a weirdo, right? You'd You'd have to have some kind of validation and that's how you would get it. So he goes, do I need that? Do I need a, a letter to prove that I am what I say I am? And he answers his own question. He says, um, I don't need a letter because you're my letter. <laughs> you're my proof. You are the proof that my lifestyle, my choices, the things that I'm teaching, that they are working. And he says, I don't need a letter written on paper. I have a letter written on the human heart. And he was referring to the fruit. That's an important word biblically. The fruit that had been produced in his life and because of the things he had done. Now, this is very countercultural, and I'll explain why here in a second. It's one of the most simple yet profound statements, I think, in the entire Bible. It's very, very important. Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, he says, a tree is known by its fruit. We are known by what we do um, because Character is defined by action over a length of time. I said that a couple of weeks ago. I was really proud of myself, thought I would slip it into a second PowerPoint. There it is. So how we live, not just what we say, establishes our reputation. Why is that countercultural? Because we live in a society nowadays to where we say, if, if we think that if we just say we are something, uh, we are that. And I'm not even going to the extent of, of the conversation of gender and things. That's not really where I'm going. We live in a society nowadays. We have created a culture to where we have things like social media. And so if someone gets onto a social media page, you know, like my page, I can self-describe, right? And we have a tendency to embellish ourselves. So we'll say things like um, world traveler, visionary, world changer, entrepreneur, right? That describes, that describes me. And sometimes I'm being facetious and sometimes we'll write things like that. But if someone calls himself a world traveler, but they've never been outside of like the Southeastern part of the United States, that's not true, right? There's more to the world than Kentucky and Alabama. Thank God. Right? So there, there's more <laughs> than those things. I shouldn't have said that. I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, alienated you, you Kentuckians and Alabama, I, I don't even know what they call people from Alabama. But if I say I'm a world traveler, then, then the fruit of that should be that I have traveled around the world, that I have seen other countries. And so what Jesus is saying is it is audacious to make a claim that we are something that there is no evidence that we are that. So if I were to tell you, if you were to say, Corey, what do you do for a living? And I'm like, well, I'm an astronaut. 
And you're like, really? How space? And I'm like, never been. Well, what is astrophysics like? I don't know. I have a degree in English. Well, I can say I'm an astronaut, but there is no fruit to back up that claim. Just like one can say I'm a Christian, but if there is no biblical evidence to support that claim, you can say it all day long. It doesn't make it so, because a tree will be known by its fruit. And so Paul makes it clear that there is a humble confidence when we are truly Christians. Through Christ before God, we can become humble, yet also confident that we are living correctly. Now, I love this, and it might be my favorite part, my, my most favorite part of this entire chapter. Paul says uh, that we are not competent in ourselves, that our adequacy is from God. And this is also very, very countercultural. What, what do I mean by that? We live in a culture and a society that says, man, follow your heart. That's really bad advice. Why? Because the Bible says your heart is the most deceptive part about you. If you follow your heart, you're gonna end up getting divorced. You're gonna end up making stupid financial decisions. You're gonna do very foolish things because you haven't used your brain and you haven't, you haven't uh, uh, used the Holy Spirit that should be residing in your heart to give you discernment and wisdom. Those are gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so we're not to look within ourselves. And the more and more the world says, man, just look inside yourself. Well, the Bible says several times in several ways that there is nothing good in us apart from the things of God. Right here, Paul says, we are incompetent. Adequacy is from God. So the more we as individuals or we as a society look to ourselves for the answers, the more incompetent we seem to be because there is nothing competent within us. Adequacy is from God. Now, if we live in a relationship with God, we can be adequate. He gives us adequacy. We can be fruitful. We can live humble, confident, productive lives. Why? Because we are living in our proper identity. That's why. Another thing Paul does is he alludes, he uses some verbiage uh, from, from the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah wrote some things that are very interesting uh, about 700 years before Paul wrote this. And God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah that he would give his people a new promise, a new covenant, not written on paper or stone, but written on the hearts and minds of his people. Now we're gonna talk about this a little bit uh, as we go through this lesson, but simply put, uh, the principles, the commands, the promises of God go beyond just a, a, a written law. They go beyond that. It goes deeper than us just making a list of things we should and shouldn't do. Faith is bigger than that. Faith should be a desire that is deep within our soul, in our hearts and in our minds, that we don't just wanna check off a list, I actually wanna to get to know God. I wanna get closer to God, I wanna emulate God, I wanna be made more into the image of God, that it's a desire that will drive our thoughts and our actions, right? What we're gonna talk about a little bit today is, is rules can only do so much. And Paul taught this. He says, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. What in the heck does that mean? So the Old Testament has a lot of laws in it. Essentially, the first five books of the Bible are the law of Moses. And so the, the, the old promises were in the Bible and, and they had a certain place and, and they still have a certain place, but there was a new covenant that was made possible only through the life, death, and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And through that, and through putting our trust in Jesus, we receive the spirit of God that helps us, that, that actually gives us life, Paul says. So about the 10 commandments, when you hear the Bible in the New Testament talk about the law, there were ceremonial laws, there were other kinds of laws like that. Uh, but the ones that, that it really focuses on are called the moral laws. And that is essentially the 10 commandments, Exodus chapter 20. Now, the 10 commandments are good. They were written many, many years ago, given, given to Moses by God many, many centuries ago, but they're still relevant, they're still good. We should still strive to follow those commandments. The problem, if I can say it like that, with the 10 commandments is the 10 commandments do not have the power to save your soul. The 10 commandments just define for us what is right and what is wrong. And we are incapable of completely following those 10 commandments perfectly all the time. So if we depend 
on just the written law, the 10 commandments to save our soul, Paul says, that's a bad deal because you're never gonna be able to live up to that. So we cannot depend just on the written law. We have to depend on the spirit of God to help us. It is Christ that will save us, not what is written in the law. So the law, the 10 commandments are just the guardrails of the road we are to walk on. So Jesus and Paul make it clear, again, we're not always going to perfectly follow those. So we depend on the spirit of God for his grace and we depend on the spirit of God to get better as time goes on. So here's the thing about the law. Laws are good. We need the laws. It is good that we have not only a 10 commandment, but it's a law virtually in every country around the world that we should not kill. It is against the law to commit murder. That's a, that's a good law. We need that law. The problem is, is the only thing that can truly stop one from killing someone is not that, it's, not that we know it's wrong to kill. That doesn't stop people from killing. People still kill. The only way to stop murder is to touch the human heart and turn it to Jesus so he can change the heart and the desires of the heart. So if I can get off track for a second, and I'm not trying to be controversial, but I'm going to explain to us how important it is that we rely on a heart change from Christ more than just checking off a box. Uh, something that I think a lot of Christians do wrong, and I'm going to try to be as clear with this as I possibly can. Um, we talk about things like abortion. And we say, well, we have to pass more laws about abortion. Um, we can pass all the laws we want about abortion. And, and, and I'm fine with the law prohibiting that. But if we pass all the laws, listen to me, and we never take the time as Christians to introduce young ladies to Jesus Christ, you're just gonna have a bunch of people who find a way to break the law. Do you hear me? Man, that guy's so liberal, doesn't even like law. No, no, no. I believe in the law, but if the heart doesn't change, people are going to break laws. And they, we've been doing it since the dawn of time. And so you can pass laws. So you, know what, you, know what the, you know what the Jews did with the 10 commandments? They added another thousand to it. There was over a thousand laws by the time Jesus came onto the scene, but humanity was screwed up. Why? They had tons of laws, but their heart hadn't been touched. And that's still the problem today. We have thousands of laws, thousands of laws, but there will always be lawlessness unless someone touches the human heart. Do you hear me? That's what Paul is trying to get to the core. I hope no one misunderstood that. I'll get a fun email about that. <laughs> Probably here in about 10 minutes or so. All right. I always like the emails while I'm preaching. I think that's the classiest thing. I think that's the classiest thing critics do is I'm up on the stage and they're, and they're like doing it. That's hap that happens more frequently than you can imagine. That's fun. I just sit back and read those and I'm like, that's the kind of person I want to hang out with. <laughs> now, if the ministry that brought death chiseled in letters on stones came with glory, so the Israelites were not able to gaze steadily at Mo Moses' face because of its glory, which was set aside. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry that brought condemnation had glory, the ministry that brings righteousness overflows with even more glory. In fact, what had been glorious is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was set aside was glorious what endures will be even more glorious. Now that's a little vague, but we'll talk about it. What Paul is doing is he's contrasting the first promise of God, the Old Testament, if you will, and the new promise of God, the New Testament, if you will. So the old covenant, the old promise of God was given to Moses who gave it then to the rest of the Jewish people. And here's the thing about that. The law was good. The 10 commandments were good, okay? Okay. And if the people would just submit and follow the first commandment, which is not to have any other gods above the real God, if they would just follow that one, God would build a relationship with them. He would show them grace. He would show them mercy. There is a big misconception that, that we didn't have grace until the cross. And that's not true. Man, it, Moses is a good example of that. Moses experienced 
tons of grace from God, had a wonderful, probably one of the most unique relationships with God mentioned in the entire Bible. He didn't see him face to face, but he got to see glimpses of God. He had a very intimate relationship with God. And Moses had committed murder at one point in his life. Not perfect, but in Moses' life, he did submit to the first commandment that he put no other gods above God. And because of that, he had a great relationship with God, saw the grace of God. The problem wasn't the law. The problem is not the 10 commandments. The problem is the human heart. Unfortunately, though Moses communicated the law to the people, the people either turned the law into a set of legalistic rules. Well, I'll just check these boxes off and I'll be good. Or they, they, they turned away from it altogether. And when we turn away from the laws or when we just make the laws just a set of rules to check off, we miss the whole point and we do not have a relationship with God. We do not live in the grace and mercy of God. So these people manipulated the laws. They added to the laws. They took away from the laws. And when we add and take away and manipulate the word of God, it will put a distance between us and God. Happening a lot nowadays. When we add to, subtract from, or manipulate the word, it detracts from our relationship with God. So the law of Moses, that's the first five books of the Bible, but let's say the, old, the whole Old Testament, right? The old covenant was intended to be a precursor to a new covenant, to, to, to a, an even greater promise. The old promise was good. So what Paul says, man, like the Old Testament, the old promise was glorious, it was good. But the New Testament, the new promise is gonna be even more glorious. What Paul is basically saying is the Old Testament is a huge, it's like a road that leads to Jesus. And Paul is saying, man, the road to Jesus is, is awesome. But what's even more awesome is Jesus. <laughs> and being in a relationship with Jesus, and we will get to be with him forever. It's not just a temporary glory, it's an eternal glory. It's kind of contrasting the old promise and the new promise. Look at this last part. Since then, we have such a hope that we act with great boldness. We are not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing steadily until the end of the glory of what was being set aside but their minds were hardened. For to this day, at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains. It is not lifted because it is only set aside in Jesus Christ. Yet still today, whenever Moses is read, that's the first five books of the Bible, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Verse 17 is very famous. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the spirit. So through Jesus our, our ability to be confident, our ability to, to grow in our faith, our ability to be bold in what we believe and confident in our lifestyle does not come from the fact that we are good. It comes from the fact that God is good. Remember, we are incompetent and God gives us adequacy. So the law is good and, and we can live a life that honors the law, even though we're not going to be perfect, we're gonna periodically fail, but if we lean on Jesus, we can live a life that honors the commands of God, therefore honors God himself. So the key to that is we have to be humble, 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 and sincere. Humble and sincere. And if we are humble and we are sincere, our journey will be filled with growth and it will be filled with grace. I've used this analogy before. It's, it's, a, it's a really simple kindergarten level object lesson, but it works well for me. Maybe it'll work for, for, for you as well. Let's pretend this back wall is evil. This is sin. This is the ways of the world, right? Now, when we get saved, we start a journey moving from that to let's say this back wall back here, which is Jesus Christ, right? Righteousness, holiness, 
the way we should live. And so over time, if we are humble and sincere, we're gonna make mistakes on this journey from this wall to that wall. But on that journey, if we're humble and sincere, the closer we get to Jesus, the naturally further we are going to get away from evil. What that means is this, when I say growth, is over time, listen to me, this is very important. Over time in my Christian walk, as I'm getting closer to Jesus, the frequency of my sin should get smaller and smaller. Corey, are you saying we're gonna be perfect? No, no, no. But you should be getting closer and closer to perfection. You're not gonna be perfect until we're in heaven but you're getting closer to perfection. That means um, if you slip up and, and, and lusted, you know, three times a week when you first got saved, over the time you're getting closer to Jesus, lust should be a, a less periodic thing. It should be less frequent, that, that we should be overcoming that lifestyle of lust, right? And we're moving closer to Jesus. Not only should the frequency of our sin get smaller and smaller as we move closer to Jesus, the severity of our sin should get smaller and smaller as we get closer to Jesus. Well, all sin is equal. That, that's not true. Um, all sin will equally separate you from a relationship with God, but all sin is not equal. That's why the Bible even refers to different sins with a level of different severity. That's why the Bible says that sins against the flesh, uh, 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 sexual sin is a greater, uh, um, it's like sinning against ourself, Paul says. It means the ramifications of sexual sin are bigger than let's say lying. Now, if you lie, uh, you may lose a friend. If we live in constant sexual deviation, there are a ton of consequences for that. And some of them may take your life. If you commit murder, that is a greater sin. There are greater ramifications for that sin than um, if you just lust after someone. Those are different, they're not the same. So as we move towards God, the severity of our sin should, should get smaller and the frequency of our sin should get smaller. There's growth. And when we make a mistake, we should, we should ask God to forgive us and he shows us grace and he shows us mercy and he gets us back on the right track, right? That's what it should look like, that walk with him. On the other hand, if we try to achieve goodness without God's help, we and whatever glory we produce quickly diminishes, it quickly fades. So Paul tells a really, really interesting story. I think it's from Exodus chapter 34. I think it's towards the end of Exodus chapter 34. I'm not sure exactly what verse. But Paul tells a story about how Moses would go up and, and talk to God, literally go talk to God on Mount Sinai. And when he would come back from the mountain, his face would radiate. Like so much people are like, whoa, Moses' face. And so he would put a veil over his face. And the reason why that Paul is saying he would put a veil over his face is because the people would look more to a man than they would to God. And if they saw the diminishing glory on his face, they would lose their faith. I mean, there's so many things you can talk about with us putting our hope in, in men and women on this earth. And, and the problem with putting all of our hope in a human, it's not that there shouldn't be role models or mentors or people in your life that help you along, but we have to know with every single human, listen, even the best humans you ever meet, our ability apart from God always comes up short. Even the best of us, even the Moseses, is that the proper way to say plural Moses? I don't know. But even the Moseses, they come up short and their glory fades. It is temporary. So many of the Jewish people, what they were doing is they were still reading the law of Moses. This is in Paul's time. They were reading the law of Moses, which is good, but they couldn't fully comprehend what the law was saying because they had not accepted Jesus Christ. They were not leaning on Jesus Christ. The Corinthians knew who Jesus was, but they were reducing the teachings of Jesus to, to just do's and don'ts, or they were scrapping Jesus's commands altogether. And this is so simple. It's so simple, yet it is so important and so fundamental. If we, we, we fail to submit our lives to Jesus, we will always have a lack of, of spiritual ignorance or a spiritual understanding. We will be spiritually ignorant. 
And not only just spiritually ignorant, it is through the spirit that we receive wisdom and discernment and the ability to just live out practical things in our life the way we should. But when we submit to Jesus, he lifts the veils from our eyes. We're able to see clearly. And a lot of you know what I'm talking about. So I have a degree in English, right? I thought when I would go to college, I would get degrees in the, in the least lucrative things possible, English and film. That's what I got my degrees in. And if you have an English degree or film degree in here, I'm sorry if I offended you. Um, but you know, we're not rich, right? Okay, anyways. So at MTSU, I think they still do this. At least they did when I was getting my undergrad in English. You could get a minor in, in biblical studies and it was not from a religious standpoint. It was from an academic standpoint because even, even secular universities consider this a, they call it a great book, right? And, and because it is, even on an academic level, it's the most influential book that's ever been written. It's packed full of 66 kind of mini books that, 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 are, that are very much in succinct with each other and, and very profound and deep. And academically, it's a pretty amazing book. But the thing is this, even with the most academic approach to this book, there are simple principles that someone apart from the Holy Spirit, they don't understand. Like a tree is known by its fruit. Like if you choose to be first, uh, you will be last. And if you're last, you will be made first. And academics scratch their head at such simple principles. That's because it's only through Jesus lifting the veil from our eyes that we can understand the depths of the word of God that it jumps off the page and comes alive and we apply it to our life and it makes absolute sense. But we have to depend on God to allow us to see those things. Now, when we give our life to Jesus, the veil is removed, right? This happened to Paul, quite literally. The veil is removed. And when that happens, sometimes that new sight takes a little bit of adjusting to. Like if you and I had veils over our eyes, right? We could see a little bit, just enough to not bang into stuff, but it's really, really dark. And if we all walked outside, you guys said the sun is shining. So if we all walked outside and we lifted off that veil, it would take a minute for us to adjust, wouldn't it? Things might look blurry. It might be so bright. We're like, oh my gosh, wow. Squinting a little bit. It takes some time. It may even be painful to our eyes. But what we learn is this. Christianity both both removes things from our life, which can be painful and take some adjusting. Christianity also adds things to our life, which can also be sometimes painful and difficult. But what we have to understand is this unveiling, this transition, even though it may take some time and may be difficult, it is good for us. It is beneficial for us. If you're new here, I, I hope this doesn't cause you to leave. I'm a vegetarian. People hear that and they think that like someone you loved has just died or something. I've been a vegetarian for about four years and um, people always ask why, right? They'll get me alone. They don't wanna know any deep intricacies of the Bible. They just wanna go, why don't you eat meat? And, and so I'll tell them, it's not because I'm a weirdo. I know I'm not wearing shoes and I have long hair, but uh, I have nothing morally against eating meat. I, I like the taste of meat. Um, when I heard that they were building an In-N-Out burger here in town, you Californians, you know how good that is. I was like, hmm, you know, can I go back to eating meat? You know, but anyways, I've second guessed it for a second. The reason why I became a vegetarian is four years ago, I went to my physician uh, who I've been with for a long time. I trust him. He's a good guy. I went to my physician and he said, hey, your cholesterol is high. And I said, I'm, you know, I'm not a big fan of taking medicine. What can I do? He goes, become a vegetarian. He goes, and we'll check that next year and see if it goes down. And I said, okay. So every year I go in, I check my levels and my levels continue to be really good and down. They drop significantly because I stopped eating meat. It's not because I wanted to stop eating meat. I like the taste of meat. But listen, just because something tastes good doesn't mean it's always good for you. And though I liked the taste of that, I understood because my physician told me that if I remove it from my life, I may live longer. Do you see what I'm saying? Some things may feel good, but they may be killing you. And if you remove them, you may live. You may live forever. Do you understand? It's not always fun, but it's beneficial. It's beneficial and it's good for us. And the physician knows better. So when we turn to Christ, it may take time to get adjusted to that new sight, but there's freedom in that new sight. 
Romans chapter six says we're no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer slaves to the influence of, of, of sin in our behavior and in our life. Instead, we are able to withstand sin, to do good, to find joy, to have fulfillment. This is very important. Freedom from sin and its ramifications does not mean freedom from righteousness. There's a lot of self-proclaimed Christians that think because we have grace in God, it gives them an excuse to continue to live in sin. And that's not freedom. Freedom from sin only comes when we become a slave to righteousness. Do you hear me? It's only when we become a slave to Christ that we understand freedom. Now, to some people, they think that sounds nuts, but it makes all the absolute sense in the world to one who has submitted to God. True freedom only comes through holy living, through righteousness. That's how we experience freedom. So when we have unveiled faces, our lives reflect God's glory. Look at what Paul says. It's like we look in a mirror and we see the imprint of God on us and we glorify God. He uses glory in this chapter about 75 times. That word, that's an exaggeration. That word simply means uh, to honor the magnificence of uh, magnif- <laughs> that word, magnificence of something. And so through his spirit, we're transformed in this life to be more like God from glory until we're one day literally in the presence of God to glory, from glory to glory. And the true Christian, the true Christian is being sanctified. That is a very fancy word for that road we were just talking about. Moving away from evil in the ways of the world, getting closer to not only being closer to Jesus, but looking more like Jesus, right? That is sanctification, that process of being made more into the image of God. Let's go back to character. We've been talking about this for a couple of weeks now. Reputation is determined less by what one says about themselves and more about what one does with themselves. I want you to remember that. You can slap a bumper sticker on your car, you can wear the shirt, you can get a tattoo, you can put it on your social media account, but if there is no evidence to back up the claim, you can say you're something all day long, but it doesn't mean that it's true. Because Jesus said a tree will be known by its fruit. The seeds we plant will inevitably result in something. And that's what we will be known by. That is what our identity is. Remember, character is defined by action over time. Action over time. Here's another ironic fact. Um, When it comes to our character, a very ironic yet biblical fact is this. In order for us to be confident about our character, confident about our life and and wisdom is we must acknowledge that we are incompetent. In order to be confident, we, we must admit that we are incapable of being what we're supposed to be. But when we realize that we are incapable of being what we're supposed to be, we have to lean on the only thing that does have the ability to make us what we're supposed to be. Remember what it said earlier in this chapter, we are incompetent. God is the one that gives us adequacy. So that goes back to the 10 commandments. Now, just following the rules cannot save us, but the rules create a guardrail for the road that leads to the one that can save us. The 10 commandments are like a big flashing arrow that points to the one that can save our soul and enable us to live in a way that honors God, honors others, right? That's what enables us to do that. And this has to be something than more than just a checklist. Here's the thing, and I'm not trying to be offensive this morning. If you came to church this morning just to avoid hell, you have missed the whole point of church. If we pray just because we want something or just because we don't want to be punished, we have missed the whole point of prayer. We've missed the whole thing. We should want to reach a place to where it's not the avoidance of hell because the avoidance of hell is a natural byproduct of just having a relationship with God. Do you wanna know what hell is? Hell is the absence of God. The Bible says anything good comes from God. So imagine a place where there's, I don't know how many people will be there, but imagine a place where a lot of people are there and none of them have any trace of anything good in them. That's hell. You don't even need the devil or fire or brimstone or any of that. If you put a bunch of people in a place that have nothing good inside them, that is hell. That is an absence of God. 
So if we want to avoid that, we just have to have a relationship with God. The avoidance of being eternally separated from him is just being in a relationship with him. And that, that's not a checklist. Well, I went to church twice this month. The, the average Christian in the United States goes once a month. Well, I've been, I've been double the average, right? I've been 50% of the time I've been at church. I don't serve or give or get involved in any way, but man, I, I show up twice a month, right? 24 times a year, I'm locked in. It's better than the average, guys. And so if we think, we think faith is reduced to that, Man, it even says in the gospel of Matthew that people are gonna stand in front of Jesus and go, Jesus, we cast demons out in your name. And Jesus' response, depart from me. I, we never knew each other. There are even going to be people who do miraculous things, but they have never built a relationship with Jesus. And so heaven and hell can be reduced to relationship with him or not a relationship with him. That's it. So only through a desire to know the truth in the things of God, can we see God? The world tells you, let me see it and I'll believe. That's what the world tells you. Show it to me and I'll believe. And God says, no, 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 believe and I'll show it to you. He says it the opposite of the world. We are such an arrogant lot, are we not? Hey, God, come prove yourself. That's arrogant, man. It's arrogant. Paul says, how dare the clay look up to the potter? and say, why'd you form me this way? It's none of your business. You're the clay. And so if we will humble ourselves and say, God, I want to believe, if we show the desire for the truth, God will show up. God will show up. It's a heart issue. And so with the pursuit of God comes freedom, and with the pursuit of God comes change. And change isn't always easy, but it's good for us. It's not always easy to go through that process of moving from there to there. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes there are people in our lives that have to be removed. Sometimes there are situations in our lives. Sometimes there are things we have to give up. That's not always easy and fun, but it's good for us. And though this change can be difficult, listen, God not only helps us in the process of getting from there to there, in that process, listen to me, we start to look more like God. We, we, we start becoming more in the image of God. That's what sanctification is. He starts to make us more like him. We start to think more like him and act more like him and respond more like him. We are made more into the image of our creator. This is fun. We haven't done this in a while. I say fun. Maybe you don't think it's fun. I always think these kinds of things are fun. Let's ask ourselves a couple of questions, right? Because I think it's healthy for us if you're a Christian here or if you're not a Christian in here. I think it's healthy sometimes for us to take a step back and give kind of an objective look at where we are in life. The first thing that I think we need to ask ourselves is, do our words match our actions? If I'm gonna say something like Jesus is Lord, if I'm gonna say that, I better understand what the word Lord means. It means that he's the boss. It means that I submit to him in everything in my life. So uh, I'm not picking on another church in town. I think those stickers are great. Jesus is Lord. That's a wonderful phrase. That's a wonderful statement. But if I'm gonna put that on my car, I better understand what Lord means. I better understand what that statement means. I better make sure that my actions honor that statement. He is Lord, right? Do our words match our actions? Again, the old, uh, the old astronaut analogy. I'm an astronaut. Well, do your actions support that claim? Corey, that's an audacious thing to say, just as much as it is to say that I follow Jesus, but I don't do anything he tells me to do. That's also very audacious. And about 60% of the United States does it. We're Christians. Well, do you know the teachings of Christ? Do you believe in these things? Can I show you some scripture? Do you line up with these? Well, no. I can say I'm a black belt, but if I've never stepped into a dojo, it doesn't make it so. It's the truth. Do our, our words match our actions? Are we trying to achieve goodness by our own means? Here's the thing about that word goodness and why I put it in quotation marks. We live in a culture right now that says we all have our differing truths. What is true to you may not be true to me. And that's the most asinine, ridiculous statement ever made. There can't be multiple truths. 
The reason why is I have two, two beautiful teenage daughters. Your truth may be that grown men can sleep with beautiful teenage daughters. That's not my truth. That collides, right? And so if you get to establish what you think is right and wrong, and you get to establish what you think is right and wrong, and I get to establish what I think is right and wrong, eventually there's going to be chaos and collision. That's the world you're seeing right now. The more morally relativistic we become, the more chaotic you're gonna see it. It's a free for all. So there has to be a baseline. There has to be an absolute standard. So where do we find that standard? If the Bible says we are incompetent, trying to find the standard within us seems like a very foolish thing to do, does it not? If we are incompetent, if there's nothing good in us apart from God, maybe we're not the best source to establish what is right and wrong. So who is? God. That's why we go to this. And this establishes what is right and wrong. And again, I said it earlier, the more we look to ourselves for competency, the more, at least to me, it appears that we are grossly incompetent. So we must lean on the only one that can make us adequate. The Bible says it is through God that we are adequate. Do we have a desire to know the truth? Really? Seriously, do we have the desire to know the truth if we get into the truth and, and something in this truth contradicts the way I live? Do I wanna know it? Do I wanna know the truth at all costs? I, I put, what if it's a costly pursuit? I'm gonna make that into a statement. It will be a costly pursuit. The truth will cost you something. Now, do I think it'll be beneficial? Absolutely. But the truth will cost you something. The last thing is this, and again, listen, I'm not bringing this up to condemn anyone in this room. I do this to myself and I need to do it more. Are we being sanctified? What that means is, are we on the path from, from the ways of the world and evil to the ways of God and being made more in the image of God? Are we on that road? And what is the evidence in your life that we are moving in the right direction? Let me, let me, let me tell you a simple way to gauge that. Am I praying now more than I were a year ago? Am I reading my Bible more now than I was five years ago? Is my attitude more Christ-like now than it was six months ago? Uh, go to the fruit of the Spirit that is mentioned in Galatians, right? That's a, that's a good, uh, the, the fruit that's mentioned in Galatians. Go back and read that and say, am I being more patient now than I was a year ago? Am I being more gentle Am I being more loving? And we can go on and on and on. And we need to gauge that. And if we are not being honest and, and seeing progression from that side to that side, something is wrong and needs to be addressed. We need to make sure that we are moving down that road. The 10 commandments show us the direction. They show us the boundaries, but it is only through leaning on Jesus that we can lean. It is only by leaning on Jesus that we can become more like Jesus. That's it. And we need to evaluate ourselves sometimes. Am I moving down the road? If we're no different than we were three years ago, something's wrong. Something's wrong. If we're no different than we were a year ago, something's wrong. Would you guys bow your heads with me, please?